Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everybody. My name is Chris, and I am an alcoholic. Hey, Chris. This is kind of a new town for me, so I'll, I'll give my AA vital statistics. Um, on or around December 28th, 1989, the grace of God separated me from alcohol. Oh, the willing, a, will, a willingness born of desperation uh, pushed me into Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, I started to do the things that I thought I needed to do to survive. And that's um, helped to maintain my spiritual condition over the years, and I haven't uh, had a drink since that, that crazy night back in December of 89. I'm very grateful for that. Um, I've always had a home group uh, since day one. Uh, since day two, I've always had a sponsor uninterrupted. Um, and I, I pay uh, I pay a lot of attention to how much time in my life goes to uh, goes to AA and goes to the spiritual life and helping others, because I know it's in direct proportion to any serenity uh, or any survival I might have. The amount of uh, attention I pay to AA stuff. The topic tonight is uh, is a little bit about uh, the history of the Big Book. And uh, I'll, I'll warn you that uh, this is my perspective. History is a fickle thing. Um, I, I love uh, I love reading about history, and, and history is uh, is flexible uh, in in a lot of ways. And it's not really an exact science. All you can do is you can gather information, and you can gather documents, and you can take personal statements, and you can put it all together. But then you have to kind of develop uh, your your own uh, perspective on what actually happened. And I've got my own unique perspective on uh, on the early days of AA. Uh, it works for me. Um, anyway, alcoholism has been around uh, thousands of years. You can read about it in the Bible, the people who drank too much wine. I believe it's, uh, I believe it's genetic. I also believe that it's... Um, uh, it's situational. Um, uh, uh, you know, you, you can drink yourself into alcoholism or you can be predestined for alcoholism. I personally think I was an alcoholic before I took a drink, but uh, I don't necessarily think that has to be the way for everybody. But it's been around since uh, since alcohol was distilled. There's always been about 10 percent of the people who uh, who would lose uh, the ability to control the amount of alcohol they, they took. And for, for many, many years, um, if you were an alcoholic and you could get to alcohol, what would happen is you would drink yourself to death. Very, very few people were able to back away from it once they became, uh, you know, what, what the book Alcoholics Anonymous uh, calls a, a real alcoholic. Um, what the scientific community or the treatment community would call uh, alcohol dependent. You know, there's the alcohol abuser, who can have DUIs and end up in rehab and everything, but if they really want to back away from alcohol, they can. Uh, the person who's alcohol dependent can't. Uh, they need massive amounts of, uh, of help to be able to do it. So those alcohol dependent or those real alcoholics would almost invariably die. Now, somewhere in the mid-1800s, uh, a group of people from Baltimore uh, got together, and uh, back then it was a it was a big temperance pledge thing that was going on. You know, luckily we did, we didn't have to put up with that too much in in, in our generation. But uh, back in those days, they you know the 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 church people would raid the bars and you know cause all kinds of trouble and try to get everybody to sign temperance or abs- abstinence uh, uh, pledges. And there were some uh, there were some guys that were drinking in Baltimore who were in pretty bad shape. And they all got together one day and decided to sign a, a temperance pledge. And, and they said, let's help each other quit drink. And this was the start of the Washingtonians. Very interesting organization. Uh, they went from six guys to hundreds of thousands of members in a few short years and then back down to nothing, like within 10 years. What happened with them is... Uh, uh, is they got involved in a lot of things that didn't have to do with staying sober. Uh, they got involved in the abolition of slavery. They got involved in uh, 
and prohibition. That, you know, some of them were Democrats, some of them were Republicans. You know, and there was a lot of infighting. And then there was people who uh, who really had to be the, the the spokespeople for the Washingtonians. The egos got involved. And what happened was uh, the Washingtonians kind of exploded from uh, from within. So those hundreds of thousands of people who were staying sober, you know, almost invariably they died drunk uh, because their society had had exploded. Comes the turn of the century. Um, a lot of uh, evangelical Christian organizations uh, started started up. Uh, there was the Jacoby Club, the Emmanuel Movement, uh, the Oxford Group. There, there was a, a number of these uh, these societies, <coughs> these fellowships, and basically what they had in common with each other is they were in uh, they were very very much interested in practicing Christian principles. I mean, really practicing it, like. You know, it was not enough for them to go to church on Sunday for an hour. They needed to go to something religious every night. And for, and on the weekends, they would have house parties or something like that. And what they would do is they, they would get together and they would challenge each other uh, to live this Christian life, to live these spiritual principles. And the most famous in Alcoholics Anonymous history is uh, is obviously the Oxford Group. Um, what uh, what a lot of people don't know is there was no AA until the book was published, really. Uh, when the book was published, then it gave the, a name for our society. But prior to the, the book Alcoholics Anonymous being published, uh, most of the people would meet in and around the Oxford Group. Um, and, the, and the Oxford Group uh, was in New York City and in Akron and a lot of other places around the world. It was uh, It was growing... Uh, very, very popular. Uh, Bill Wilson was exposed to the Oxford group uh, through Ebby Thatcher. Uh, Dr. Bob was exposed to the Oxford group through his wife, Ann Smith. And they were both going uh, to Oxford group, uh, Dr. Bob, for about three years before he got sober. Bill Wilson for, I don't know, six months or so before he got sober. And what would happen... Uh, in these groups is there would be so much spiritual participation that there would be that shift in perspective. There would be that change in personality. And these otherwise hopeless drunks would sober up. And this this is happening uh, all throughout the Oxford group. There's there's early Oxford group literature uh, that you can read that predates Bill Wilson getting sober. Uh, some of the people who got sober and changed spiritually in the Oxford group wrote books. One of them was called The Big Bender. One of them was called I Was a Pagan. You know, a, a lot of these books you can still find. And they have stories in them about uh, drunks getting sober. So it was not a new thing uh, when Bill and Bob got sober in the Oxford group. It, was, it had been happening for years. The, Bill was just the first person to put a structure together just for alcoholics using the Oxford Group formula. Now, um, it was significant, I think, in uh, the formation of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, Bill was uh, certainly uh, the principal architect of what we have today. What What he did that was a lot different than the other people that were getting sober was, and you can read this in his story, the thought comes to him on his hospital bed that millions of alcoholics are out there dying. And if they could only have this message, they could could survive. Now, this is on his detox bed. He comes to the conclusion that he specifically can help these alcoholics. Now, if it wasn't for that, um, that thought, if it wasn't for dedicating his life to that from that moment onward, you know, many of us would be dead. I know I would be dead without Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I was uh, I was a drunk of the hopeless variety. I, I'd been trying to separate from alcohol for many years, and I I drank with a chronic intensity. I would go from sober to blackout drunk in an hour and a half. I mean, you know, my drinking was chronic at the end. And, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do anything about it. I really couldn't. I knew it was crazy. I knew it was really bad for me, but I, but I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't stop. 
So Bill on his hospital bed decides that he is going to carry the message of the Oxer group to these alcoholics that are still suffering out there. And he begins to do that. He starts running around to, to uh, you know, to, to the, the Bowery, the bars. He really didn't know where to go. It was, uh, he was learning how to do this in the first six months. And he wasn't, uh, he wasn't successful with anybody, I believe, because he was, he was trying to 12-step people that didn't want to be 12 step. Anybody in here ever try to carry the message to somebody who isn't ready or doesn't want it? It's a waste of time. And uh, he was wasting a lot of time. And he was feeling depressed about it. Uh, but his wife Lois said, Bill, you know, you, you think you've failed at this, but guess what? You know, you're still sober. And it started to dawn on him that um, it was beneficial to one's own sobriety to try to help other people get sober. And there, therein started the, the, the philosophy, the AA philosophy that you have to, yeah, to, to keep it, you have to give it away. Now, um, he'd failed with everybody he worked with, and uh, like, like most alcoholics, he had a huge ego, and he was playing around with Wall Street, and the thought, um, the thought comes to him that he, he, needs to, he needs to pull a proxy battle with this, this tire company in Akron, and you know, if, he can, if he can manipulate this whole business situation to his advantage, he can end up being the president of a tire company, you know? Like, here he is sober six months, he's going to be the president of a tire company. Does that sound familiar? Does anybody, anybody work with newcomers? You know, so, so he, he talks all these people into it, and they take the train out to Akron, and, and it falls apart. It goes down like the Hindenburg. And, and they're all pissed off at Bill for talking them into this and wasting their time. So they just all split. Now, he's really got no money. Uh, he's, he's in the middle of Akron, you know, he's depressed because the business deal went south and he walks into the, to the Mayflower hotel and, uh, uh, and this is the period of time that it talks about in his story where the bar is over there, you know, the crowd is just there, you know, the, the sounds and the smells from the bar, it's bringing him back. And the telephone is over here, and he knows he needs to work with an alcoholic to stay sober. And, you know, we're here, everybody, we're here by seconds and inches. You know, we, we just really are. Uh, it could have gone either way, but he could have walked into the bar, and there could have never been Alcoholics Anonymous. But instead, he went to the phone, and he started dialing people. And he, he didn't really get a great uh, response from most of the people on the phone, because here's what he said. Hi, my name's Bill Wilson. I'm a rummy who needs to talk to some other rummies. I'm from New York, you know, and and nobody understood what the hell he was talking about. But he ended up calling up this this guy, uh, Walter Tonks, who was involved with the Oxford group. And he was in a prayer group. He was in a prayer group of people with Ann Smith. And they were all praying for Dr. Bob to somehow get sober. Now, another crazy coincidence. So this guy goes, you're, you're a rummy who, who, you know, you don't drink anymore. And you, need to, you need to talk to people to stay sober. I know the guy, you know. And, uh, uh, and so instead of getting a bizarre response, uh, when he gets on the phone with, uh, with Henrietta Cyberling, she goes, How, why did it take you so long to call? We've been praying for months, <laughs> you know. So, uh, so the meeting was arranged. I think it was Mother's Day or something like that. <clears throat> and uh, and and uh, uh, Bill uh, can't really go see him that night because he's uh, uh, Dr. Bob is stewed. Uh, but just to keep peace, Dr. Bob says, "Okay, tomorrow bring bring the clown over tomorrow, and, I, and I'll talk to him." Now, significant in this meeting is a shyster stockbroker bringing the message of the illness alcoholism to a surgeon. Dr. Bob was a surgeon. He was he, he, he was a proctologist, okay, and he was running out of proctors to work on. I'll tell you that because <laughs> because uh, you know he was always drunk, and, and there was a there was a, a big joke going around the hospital that he worked in that if you go to Dr. Bob Smith, you could lose your ass. <laughs> and, uh, and and I got to tell you that was you know when I see the story in the back of the book, Dr. Bob's nightmare, I always think it should be Dr. Bob's patient's nightmare. <laughs> You know, because the la because after his last drink, they filled him with sedatives and sent him into the operating room. You know, gave him a bunch of beers, put some sedatives in him, and said, 
Go do that operation. You know? I can imagine the guy strapped in there going, whoa, second opinion. You know? Uh, anyway. Anyway, I digress. Anyway, um, you know, what happens? This is what's really significant in this story. Here's a, sh- here's a shyster stockbroker bringing basically uh, uh, the, the medical estimate of the problem and the spiritual solution to a surgeon. I don't know if anybody else knows doctors in here, but sometimes they already know. You know what I mean? It's very, very difficult sometimes to, to tell them something, especially if it's not even your field of study. So, um, so instead of going in and hammering Dr. Bob about his drinking, Bill went in and talked about his own drinking. And as he's telling his story, in other words, he wasn't there to get Dr. Bob sober. He was there to stay sober himself. So he's he's talking about his alcoholism. And, and Bob Smith is, is identifying, yeah, I did that too. Yeah, I did that too. By the end of the conversation, <clears throat> Dr. Bob had bought into this enough to say, yeah, I want a part of this. I've been trying to quit drinking forever. You know, I'll, I'll give this a shot. So they kind of uh, they kind of hooked up. Now now, Dr. Bob drank again. He had to go to Atlantic City to the convention. You ever sponsor guys like I got a tour with the dead, you know? <laughs> but you've only got two weeks sober. Yeah, but I always tour with the dead in June, you know. And uh, okay, well you're gonna be dead. Uh, but go ahead, you got to learn your own lessons. So they had to put him on the train. He didn't even make it to Atlantic City before he was drunk. And, and this is back when conductors would, like, you know, take the drunken person back home and stuff. And they, they got him back to Akron. And uh, here's another thing that's very, very significant. You know, there's a lot of talk these days about, you know, the, the timetable for the steps. How long does it take you to go through the steps? Now, I, I, you know, uh, my main home group in the 90s, uh, there was one of the elder statesmen. I mean, this, this guy had been sober 25, 30 years, and everybody listened when he talked. He would, he would share, it took me four years to do a four-step, and I, I just can't imagine anybody doing a four-step before four years. It would take you four years to get your head out of your ass. And this is basically what he, he would share. And, you know, I take exception to that today. And, and I do it because of the information in the, in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. It's our basic text. It basically says um, it, it doesn't give weeks or months or days. What it does is it gives action directives, like immediately, at once, you know, things like that. So if you follow those action directives, you're going to move through the steps pretty quickly. Now, what happened was uh, Dr. Bob had balked on amends. Now picture this. You're a proctologist, and most of the harm you've done is in the operating room, okay, because you've been a bad doctor. You're going you're gonna to go make amends, <laughs> you know? You've got to go knock up one side of the street and down the other for what? Ruining everybody's ass? So he had some he had some trepidation and he held back on this in his first uh, his first run through. Right after his the operation that they had to give him beers and sedatives, right afterward he disappears. And Bill and Ann thought, you know, where did this guy go? Where did this guy go? What's going on with him? And what he did was he realized that that was the weak link in his program. He had not made amends. This was part of the Oxford group uh, 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 principles. So he went up one side of the street and down the other and he made direct amends as best, best he could and that was his last, that was his last drink. Significant in, in all this is, uh, is the action that these early members took. Now, <clears throat> when they decided to put the book Alcoholics Anonymous together, um, they had a couple of other ideas. One of them was to, to hire a bunch of paid missionaries. Another one was to open up a bunch, bunch of hospitals. But you really needed money for that. But it didn't take much money to sit at a typewriter and type up a book. So, so that's what they ended up uh, doing. 
It took Bill quite a long time. There was many, many drafts of the material. There was m much discussion in the meetings at that time between Akron and New York about the information that was being put in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. And at least the first five chapters or so, it's a basic consensus of information that, that most of the members would uh, agree with in, uh, you know, in the early Oxford group drunk squads. Now, when that was published, um, it was published in uh, 1939. To this day, now, one of the things I do uh, for a, a living is I'm, I'm involved in, uh, I'm involved around uh, the addictive illness treatment world. I mean, that's, that's where I'm making my money right now. I've also been involved with AA for, for near 20 years at, at a very, very deep level. And I've paid attention, and I do a lot of reading. And if, uh, if there's a book out there that people are talking about, I usually read it. I'm telling you, there has not been anything even near as good as the book Alcoholics Anonymous for Addictive Illness Recovery. The 12-step uh, program has been found to be so significant in addiction recovery, recovery from obsessive-compulsive disorders, uh, the, the, the spiritual principles and the action items in those steps have transferred over into over 200 12-step fellowships. You can find those steps in uh, Overeaters Anonymous, uh, 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 Crystal Meth Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, <clears throat> Families Anonymous, I mean, you know, Tower Snipers Anonymous. I mean, you know, if, if you just, if, if, you know, every couple of months you get that urge to, you know, lock and load and climb a tower, you know, if you practice the steps, you'll find that uh, that, that obsessive compulsive disorder can be removed. They, it's the most significant recovery process that's ever been, and I think that ever will be. And when I'm looking back at the people who put this book together, it's, it's pretty startling. Because there's been addictionologists that for 30 years they've been studying addiction and alcoholism that have, they, they haven't come close to putting something together that actually works like this book. Now, when the book came out, um, I got a lot of information uh, from, uh, from Barefoot Bill over there. He, somehow he tracked down <clears throat> like 40 or 50 book reviews of the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And near every one of them slammed the book. Like this, don't bother with this piece of crap, you know. It's like, you know, it's you know, written by people that don't know what the hell they're doing. And I mean, it was pretty much slammed uh, when, it, when it first came out. And very few people bought it. What got the book around was some media attention. Uh, there was a there was an article in the Saturday Evening Post. There was a Liberty Magazine article. What happened was uh, uh, they were really smart about getting uh, good media attention. And when they got this media attention, all of a sudden the book started to sell. The meetings started to expand like crazy, and people started to understand a little bit about the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Now. When I got sober, I got sober in 1989 in uh, the Somerset County area. Um, uh, I, was, uh, I, I was basically in Bur Burnersville, Baskin Ridge, and Myersville meetings. The big book had grown out of favor by 1989. In other words, the significance of the recovery uh, answer in the book had near faded away. It just wasn't, just wasn't popular anymore. What, and and there's, there's a number of reasons for that, I think. Uh, one, one of the reasons was the publication of the 12 and 12. Uh, the 12 and 12 took a lot of attention off of the book Alcoholics Anonymous because people understand you're in a 12-step program. You should pay attention to the steps, right? I, I mean, the most insane thing I've ever seen in my life is somebody join a 12-step program and, never, and not do the steps. You know, that's like joining uh, uh, the Oprah Book Club and never reading any of the books, but discussing them. You know, doesn't on the show. I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all, but you see that, like, throughout Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think, I think one of the reasons was uh, because of the 12 and 12. 12 and 12 was published, uh, you know, in the very early 50s. And uh, I don't think, 
As a matter of fact, I know that the 12 and 12 was not published to supersede the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, The traditions were very, very important for Bill to get published. He felt that writing 12 essays on the steps and putting it in the same book as the traditions was going to get the traditions out there. And that was his that was his main agenda. It was not to uh, to to rewrite the steps. But what happened when I came in uh, was uh, with, without, there were no big book groups. There was a big book meeting, but what they'd do is they'd start at you know, the title page and read all the way through the stories. And you'd read a couple of paragraphs and share. And so it literally took about a year and a half to get through the book. And three quarters of the time you're on the stories. So that was really the only big book around, meeting around. So I, I, I didn't understand the significance of the book. I didn't have any experience with it, but I was going to four 12 and 12 meetings every week because that's what we're around. I couldn't shake a stick without hitting a 12 and 12 meeting. Now, I'm I'm what's known as a chronic, hopeless, real, alcohol dependent, somebody who's in real trouble with alcohol. Um, In the American Medical, the American Medical Society describes alcoholism as a chronically relapsing condition. So if you go into a doctor and you say, I'm an alcoholic, he's going to say, oh, there's a chronic relapsing, you know, pay me now. You know, I'm, I, I'm not going to give you a bill. I, I mean, you know, that's what they're going to see. They're going to see chronically relapsing individual. And that's what, uh, what uh, I, I, I was. Going to these 12 and 12 meetings, I, I found out something, you know, and, and I only knew, I only learned this in hindsight. A lot of times you only learn things by looking back at them. And after I got my own experience with the book Alcoholics Anonymous, I looked back on all this, all this time I spent in the 12 and 12 meetings. And what I came to recognize was uh, 12 and 12 meetings are great for talking about the steps, reading about the steps, sharing about the steps, thinking about the steps, philosophizing about the steps. But you rarely get an opportunity to actually do them and, and, or be encouraged to do them in the 12 and 12 meetings. It's more psychological. So I was going to a lot of 12 and 12 meetings, and I, I wasn't getting my own experience. Now, I believe, uh, I believe the book Alcoholics Anonymous is, uh, is a textbook. It's the basic text of our fellowship. And if you think about a textbook, a textbook, the, textbooks have certain things in common. One of the things is, is it's good to, the, the, if it's taught. You, you almost need to teach a textbook. Uh, very few people can just grab a textbook and learn everything by just reading it. Another thing about a textbook is you need to take the exercises or you need to solve the problems. Now, in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, I had one perspective of it when I read it in rehab, and I had a whole other experience with it when I actually went through it and did what it asked me to do. In the early days, uh, in the early days of AA, uh, during their flying blind period, they found that some of these Oxford group spiritual exercises were conducive to recovery. Some of them weren't. Some of them were. During the architecture of putting the book together, they grabbed everything that seemed to be common with the people that were staying sober. So, uh, in effect, the, uh, the significant part of the book Alcoholics Anonymous is they tell you what you need to do to recover, not stay sober. Uh, I see sobriety and recovery as two completely different things. If you want to get sober and stay sober, hit a cop and spend six months in jail. And you can be, you can be sober. Uh, recovery, recovery has a lot of attributes like serenity and peace of mind. And you, you know, when, when you've recovered from alcohol, uh, alcoholism, you, you, don't have, um, you don't have the symptomology of the active alcoholic. Now, you're never cured of alcoholism. It even says that in our book. And I, I, want, to, I want to talk briefly about the difference because there's always somebody that wants to challenge me about being recovered, even though it's written in the book 16 times. That's how it describes us. Uh, there'll still be somebody that's got a problem with that. This is the difference between cured and recovered. Let's say you have an illness or a disease and it's cured. That means the disease is removed. Okay? It's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. 
However, if you've recovered from an illness or a disease, the symptoms are gone. The best we can ever hope for with alcoholism uh, or any true, true addiction, true dependence, is to have the, um, uh, have the uh, effects, have the symptoms removed. Now, I know that if I walked across the street and had a drink, what would happen is the physical craving for alcohol would take over. My, my body hasn't healed from alcoholism. Uh, if I put alcohol in my body, I'm going to get that craving and I'm going to end up tongue chewing, knee walking, drunk by the end of the night. It happened every time and it would happen tonight if I started drinking. Uh, however, that, uh, that, that insanity, the obsession of the mind that kept dragging me back to alcohol, even though it was the stupidest thing I could do, that's been removed. That, that obsession of the mind ha, has been removed. I don't suffer from it anymore. So I, can, I consider myself a recovered alcoholic. And the book, the whole point of the book is to get us to a state called recovered. That's what the book is about. Now, here's, here's some of the things that, um, that uh, I see have happened in Alcoholics Anonymous over the years because I go right back to my direct experience in the Somerset County area in 1989, 90, 91 when I was getting sober. In the early days of AA, they had the 12 steps. They, they had the recovery process. And then the book was written, and then the fellowship started. Okay, So they had a program of recovery with a support fellowship. Today, what I see in a lot of areas is I see a fellowship. Everything's about fellowship and a sometimes re uh, recovery support system. There, there are still areas, there are still areas where it would be very, very easy for you to stumble into AA and not get somebody to offer to take you through the steps, not get an experienced sponsor who can lead you through the path uh, of the 12 steps to recovery. That can still happen. And that's a huge shift from where we came from to where we are today. The, the saving grace of all this is the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, the basic text of our fellowship. How I see this book is it's a bullshit sifter. That's what it is. If somebody's telling you something or somebody's sharing something and it goes absolutely contrary to the book Alcoholics Anonymous, as an AA member, you have every right in the world to just not pay attention to that. There's a lot of information in AA today. There's a lot of good information. There's a lot of bad information today. So the good thing about the book is it's always going to bring us back to our roots. It's always going to bring us back to what really works, what's really significant for recovery from alcoholism with alcoholics. And, you know, I, I see that uh, what they've done, in effect, is they've made it near impossible to change the book Alcoholics Anonymous in any significant way. Uh, General Service or AA uh, World Service has basically made it uh, near impossible to change or get rid of the book Alcoholics Anonymous. So I see that that part of uh, uh, that legacy that we have, uh, that, that legacy of recovery is going gonna, is gonna to remain safe. However, you know, there are, there are certain areas and there are certain groups that uh, don't really see the need for, um, for an intense um, uh, attention to be paid to the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, today there's a, there's, a, there's a renaissance going on with this big book. And how I, how I see it and how it's happened is, is this. In, uh, in the mid-80s, uh, I'm sorry, in the, in the late 70s, uh, a couple of guys named Joe and Charlie from Arkansas <clears throat> were showing up at a lot, of a lot of the state conventions. And they asked for a room. They said, you know, we, we want to do a little big book study. We want to get back to some of the basics. And can we have a room? And they asked these different conventions if they could have a room. And they started to go through the book Alcoholics Anonymous like it's a textbook. And it was the first time it had happened in a long time. Well, people started showing up uh, at this. They, they, they really started to get into it. Because when you start to hear 
the recovery process, it can sometimes be interesting. And if you're somebody who's in real trouble, you recognize an answer with this material that you have not been hearing. So these meetings started to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally, they, you know, they needed much bigger rooms to do their uh, to do their workshops. Somebody said, hey, can I tape this? And they taped a Joe and Charlie workshop around 1978 or so. <coughs> now, at the next convention, the taper felt this material was so important that he made multiple copies of these cassettes, and he gave them away at this convention at the banquet strategically as like door prizes. In other words, he picked the people he knew would respond to this message at the different tables from the different states, and he basically Johnny Appleseeded these things to the right people, and all of a sudden, boom, you know, Joe and Charlie are huge. They're going all around the country. Has anybody in here ever, you know, back in the day gone to a Joe and Charlie? Well, they started this whole renaissance. They started this whole let's get back into the book in a significant way. Um, there's been a number of people who've expanded on what Joe and Charlie were doing. Uh, you know, a couple of my favorite uh, favorites, well, well, Joe H. Uh, from Santa Monica, Mark, Mark H. from Austin, Texas. These are, uh, these are guys who, uh, who did the same type of thing. But there's been many, many people who have done workshops in this, uh, in this renaissance. You know, Bill over there is one of them. You can't shake a stick without hit, hitting a, a Bill workshop. And, uh, and, you know, thank God for this because, because it's definitely needed. What had happened was Alcoholics Anonymous being a program with a support fellowship shifted all the way to being a fellowship with maybe a program. You know, the pendulum has to swing back to the middle for alcoholics to be safe, to be able to recover. And what's happening is there's now a big book movement uh, going around the country, and there's many, many people that are participating in it. It usually really pisses off you know, heavy drinkers or people that don't need the big book. But I'll tell you what, it's saving a whole lot of lives. A lot of those people who relapse over and over again and everybody says to them, you're not being honest or you just don't want it enough. Well, they do want it enough and they are being honest. They're just not being offered a solution significant enough to be able to stay sober. The big book movement is addressing that. That's why it's so significant in, uh, in, in my mind. Now, we're on our fourth edition of the big book now. Um, you know, the, there's been a lot of small changes, but the major changes in the book are in the stories. Um, the stories are basically laid out for people to be able to identify if they're an alcoholic or not. One thing that's very, very important in the big book is identification. Are you an alcoholic? Are you a heavy drinker? What are you? And in the first couple of chapters, there's enough information for most people to accurately appraise uh, whether or not they're an alcoholic or they're just a problem drinker. That was very, very important in the early days of AA. It's become less important today. Um, the, the decisions were made in Alcoholics Anonymous to throw the doors wide open. If you have a desire to stop drinking, you know, ollie ollie oxen free, you're in. And, uh, and you know, I have no, I have no problem uh, really with that at, at all. I think if you can save someone, like it says in the, uh, the 12 and 12 in step one, if you can save somebody 10 or 15 years of horrible alcoholic drinking by exposing them to uh, recovery fellowship, do so. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is there's a scale of alcoholism. It says no matter how far down the scale you've gone, you'll find that, you know, your experience can be... Uh, and then there's another part that says uh, your ability to quit drinking on a uh, non-spiritual basis will depend on how much control you've lost in drink. There's a ton of, in, in the chapter to wives, there's a heavy drinker, alcoholic, one, two, three, and four. There's a lot of information in there so you can find out what your own truth is. How much trouble are you in? You need to know how much trouble you're in or you can be in big trouble. Now, uh, uh, 
the great thing about this big book movement is, believe it or not, Alcoholics Anonymous had become a dangerous place for the very people Alcoholics Anonymous was formed for, which were the hopeless, you know, skid row, mental hospital drunks. You know, the absolute, they absolutely could not stop drinking. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous was formed for. Over the course of time, it became a very, very dangerous place for those people because there wasn't this attention, this intensity of looking at the recovery process like, like is happening now in the big book movement. You know, if you're part of the big book movement, Bill will agree with me on this. It doesn't always make you the most popular person in the room. Um, you know, who the hell is that guy? I, you know, this ain't the way we do it in my group. You know, the, 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 the Matasquan closed-minded discussion meeting. You know, we don't do it like <laughs> You know, and, uh, and you know, we, we get a lot of rocks thrown at us. But, but, the, but the fact of the matter is, is there are people who are in real trouble. And attendance at AA meetings does not treat alcoholism. AA meetings are not a treatment for alcoholism. They're a place where we're supposed to band together and support each other to work the spiritual program of action, to live a spiritual life. We're supposed to support each other doing the things that it tells us to do in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, we've been inundated from all kinds of areas. Uh, 19, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 1955, 56, the American Medical Society said alcoholism is a disease. Drug addiction is a disease, okay? What happened after that was that made it incumbent upon insurance companies to pay for the medical treatment of the disease. That opened up the door for a huge amount of business for people who were going to start up rehabs, detoxes, uh, dry out farms, whatever you want to call them. Now, when I got sober in the 80s, there was four treatment centers within walking distance of my house. Not a one of them had a frigging clue, but they were there and they took your 14 grand and, and you know what I mean? So what happens in these 28 day places? Uh, depending on the 28 day place, practically anything. It could, it could go as bad as, you know, they would shave half your head and make you beg to have the other half shave all the way to trying to help you work through the steps. There was a, there was a, 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 a huge spectrum of different type of treatment approaches. Now, what happened when all, what happens to all these people at the end of 28 days? Where do they get sent? They get sent into AA. All right, where do, you, where do you think group came from? Sitting around in a circle talking about what the hell went on with you today. Where do you think that happened? That's because they do group in treatment centers. So all of a sudden you got the circle and everybody, oh, I had a terrible day, oh, I had a terrible day, oh, the Lord's Prayer, see you next week. <laughs> That's not a treatment for alcoholism. So... Um, so we've been inundated with uh, with a lot of outside influences. So there's a lot of things that people think are AA that are not. It's the, the stuff has come from uh, from from treatment centers, and you know some of it's good. I mean, you know, some of it's good, some of it's not so good. Some of it doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, one of them one of them is no major changes in in the first year. All right. The book Alcoholics Anonymous tells you very, very quickly to completely change the way you think and completely change the way you act. That has to happen almost right away. That complete personality change at depth, spiritual awakening, boom, you're, you're reborn as a, as a completely different person. That's what the book asks you to do. But no major, major changes. You know, so I'm going to go back to the big book is the bullshit sifter. If it's not in there, if it can't directly line up with it, if anything I say doesn't directly line up with it, uh, you know, please uh, look at look in the other direction and don't don't take it seriously. But the fact of the matter is, is uh, there is a significant answer for alcoholism in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. To understand that answer, you need to experience it. If you haven't experienced the 12 steps, all you're going to have is an opinion based on no experience. 
um, I had a, a completely wrong idea of what the fourth step was going to do for me until I did it. I had a completely wrong idea about what the fifth step was going to do for me until I did it. I had a completely bizarre conception of what it was going to be like when I did all my amends until I did all my amends. You learn it experientially. Here's one of the things that I heard forever in, the early, in my early days of AA in the 12 and 12 meetings. It would be a ninth step meeting. And somebody would raise their hand and say this, I haven't done this step formally but I'm going to take this meeting hostage for the next 10 minutes and tell you what my opinion is on the step if I ever would do it. You know, that's not how you understand these steps. You understand these steps after you do them. Um, you, you know, and, and it, would have been, it would have been unorthodox for somebody to raise their hand in one of these meetings and say something like, I just got back from California. I did eight of my last amends. I'd like to share a little bit of my experience. You know, people would look at him like, who the hell is this guy actually doing this stuff? I mean, it was, it was, re it was really bad in my area. Now, um, now the, the book Alcoholics Anonymous, we're, we're going to be talking about a bunch of different topics, and it's not always going to be me. Uh, it's, uh, Dave is going to be doing uh, Aspects of the Illness Step 1 next week. We've lined up a bunch of, uh, a bunch of speakers who really have a strong message, and they're interesting to, look, uh, to listen to. You know, it's, we're going to try to bring some uh, some fun in, into this, and uh, we hope that uh, we hope that everybody will, will come back. Uh, there's there's like four minutes. Uh, does anybody have any have a have a burner that they need to share? Lisa, thank you for asking us down here. This has been great. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.